Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Clinton. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From, from the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are, are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Let us pray. Our glorious God, who comforts us in distress, we pray not only for First Baptist Church, but for all congregations in this community, across this nation, and around the world. Grant wisdom to leaders and church members alike. Grant strength and courage for the facing of this hour and the living of these days. Grant that the Holy Spirit will guide us to the most faithful ways to live out our faith and carry out our ministries while also protecting the health and safety of all. On this unusual Sunday morning, when many more of us will worship alone than is normal, help us still to experience the love, power, and presence of Jesus in ways that still us, comfort us, and hold us secure. In the midst of the storm, 
Guide us to find the most faithful ways to share Christ's love and extend his peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray also for federal, state, and local officials who have the urgently important responsibility of making decisions, sharing information, and coordinating responses so that the spread of this virus might be slowed and eventually controlled. We pray for doctors and nurses who will care for those who are ill. We pray for researchers who will do the life-giving work of developing a vaccine over the course of time. May your spirit guide and strengthen them all for their task so that you'll be glorified through their work. We remember particularly those most vulnerable to this virus, upon whom it could have the most devastating impact, those in the higher risk categories and those who live in poverty who have less access to care or who live out of reach of information. Protect them and lead the stronger to exercise toward the weaker compassion in accordance with that of your son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We invite everyone at home to join in with us, sing along with us, our praises to our gracious God.
Through these trials, you've always been faithful. You bring healing to my soul. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will You will never leave me. I am not alone. 
Good morning. It's so good to be with y'all this morning, even though it's in this uh, different kind of format. I want to really express appreciation to, to Mark McMahon and Braden Webb for all the work they did this week to make this possible for us to be able to do the kind of uh, presentation you're getting to see this morning. And, and it's I've been our prayer from the beginning that God would, would use this and bless this. And so let's just start with prayer. God, uh, thank you so much for being a God who, in spite of what we perceive to be chaos, can do anything. And if we are willing and able, Lord, you will use us to engage the world. And God, I pray that you would do that even now in this time of crisis for our country. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful in doing everything you put in front of us to do. Now, Lord, may your word go forth from this place through your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start off by just being honest, and, and that is by admitting that we all worry. We're talking about peace and the panic, and probably going to be talking about this for a couple of weeks, but, but the fact is, every one of us worries. Now, we worry about different things. You may worry about uh, health. That may be your chief concern. Uh, another person's may be the ball game that now is not scheduled to take place. Somebody else's uh, may have to do with wanting to, to get down a dress size. Somebody else's may have to do with, with uh, being a, uh, a, getting a call from a guy that she'd hoped that was going to call and, and ask her out on a date. Maybe it's the weather that concerns you. Or maybe it's your next paycheck. Will it be enough? Or will it be there at all? Everyone worries on some level. Me too. I was up till after 2 o'clock this morning worried about this this morning. Was it going to work and how was it going to happen and all those kind of details. And I was awake and my mind was racing at 2 o'clock this morning. But I don't just worry about stuff like this. I worry about my kids. I want them to have good friendships. And, and I want them to, to display kind strength everywhere they go and follow Jesus passionately. I worry about my, my wife, Dana, and cancer and and a cure for cancer, and, and that she'll have peace in the middle of this storm that we're in. I worry about my mom, that she'll stay healthy, that she won't fall and, and, and hurt herself, that she'll keep making and being friends up in the mountains of North Carolina. What do you worry about? In fact, let me get more pointed. What do you worry about more today than you did two weeks ago? Has it changed somewhat for you? Are you finding yourself in the middle of this panic storm that seems to have overtaken so much of our country? I can't speak for the world because I hadn't been outside the country in the last few weeks, but I know in our country there sure seems to be a lot of panic going around. We are in pandemic times, unprecedented for any of us now living, and we probably have more worries today than normal. So in the panic that's overtaken so much of the world, how can we find peace? How can we, if we call ourselves God's people, how can we find peace in the panic? I, I believe Jesus would have us to operate that way. I believe Jesus would have us to be people who are willing to live the way he lived. And y'all, he lived in peace. Somebody asked Dallas Willard once, a, a mentor of mine, uh, what one word he would use to describe Jesus. And guys, you talk about a big question. That's a big question. What one word would you use to describe the Word of God Himself? And all kind of words came to this person's mind as they asked the question of Dallas. But Dallas's response was astonishing. What one word would you use to describe Jesus? And Dallas said relaxed <laughs> y'all Jesus lived at peace he wasn't wringing his hands when this huge crowd came upon them on the Galilean hillside and there wasn't an Ingalls market to be found anywhere and do you remember when he and his friends were out in the middle of a boat and it started getting swamped with water do you remember Jesus what he was doing he was sound asleep if there's anybody who can help us find peace in the panic, it's Jesus. So 
I want to take just a moment and turn to the most significant teaching of Jesus in all of Scripture. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I want to be right in the middle of that, Matthew 6. I want to start reading with verse 25 because he tells us how we can find peace, even in the midst of the panic. He says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds, Jesus says. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing, Jesus goes on. Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and are thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. And then Jesus uses the phrase, to describe his disciples that he uses 12 times in the Gospels. He made this phrase up. He calls them little faiths. He says, why do you have little faith? Or he says, oh, you little faiths. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, people outside the kingdom. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I love the way that our master teacher Jesus just plunges immediately into the guts of the practical needs of our lives. Food and clothing. You don't get any more practical than food and clothing. And Jesus tells us to do something that would have astounded the listeners that he was talking to originally. He says, be like the birds. Now, why would that have astounded his original audience? Because the rabbis of that day were teaching that we couldn't be like the birds. We had to make our living by the sweat of our brow. They focused on the curse of Genesis 3, and they forgot The God who made the world would provide for them as well. And so Jesus comes up with this astonishing statement. Be like the birds, he says. If we belong to God, if we belong to God, we can trust God so fully that just like the birds can, we can sleep at night. We can sleep and rest well at night. And I know that flies in the face of so many of our understandings and so many of our practices because I know how many of us respond to times of panic, to times where anxiety starts to rise. We want to try to control everything. And if we can't control it, we either will opt out of that activity or we will freak out in the middle of that activity. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you have a driver. You're driving and somebody who wants to control everything is sitting next to you and they're having a hard time dealing with that situation. But Jesus says, no, don't try to control everything. The birds don't store in barns. He says, live like the birds do. Carefree. Now now listen, birds are not lazy. He's not calling for laziness. Birds are up early. They probably woke you up this morning. Birds are are working all day. They, They go about their business very well, but they are not anxious about where tomorrow's provision is going to come from. His second example of a worry free life, how we can find peace in the panic, is wildflowers. Y'all, I've been to Israel several times, and I can tell you the Galilean hillsides are covered with all kinds of of flowers. Small, some of them, bigger, others. They're intricate. They are glorious. They're colorful. They're sumptuous, and they're beautiful. Do you think those flowers in their adolescence were concerned about their appearance? 
Do you think they wondered if they were ever going to be beautiful one day? No. And God takes care of the flowers, Jesus says. He clothes them splendidly. God knows what we need, Jesus tells us. God knows all that we need. Now, I know some of you have got your Bible open. You're sitting at home and some of you have even heard this passage before. And so some of you may have even kind of yawned through it because it's such a familiar passage to us. Let me ask you, if this passage is so familiar, if it is so cliched, why then do we worry? Jesus tells us not to. He's supposed to be our master. He's supposed to be our leader. If he tells us not to, why then do we worry? I got an idea on that. Let me just talk about this for just a few minutes. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not even a, a trained counselor. I had a few counseling classes, but I'm no trained counselor. But the way I understand it, anxiety is often the consequence of perceived chaos. That's where anxiety comes from. It's the consequence of perceived chaos. If we sense ourselves to be victims of unseen, turbulent, random forces, we are troubled. Now, I'm pulling that, that idea from a study that psychologists did during World War II. They were uh, trying to figure out soldiers and soldiers' health and trying to keep them mentally healthy. And they were doing these analyses of different soldiers. And they found that the infantry soldier, the average infantry soldiers, could only take 60 days of continuous combat. Or, and this is the psychologist's word, or they would become emotionally dead. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. 60 days of, of every, every moment you're having to be on your toes and your nerves being on edge all the time because you don't know when a mortar bomb is going to drop in. Or, or it, and it could happen. A, a sniper could take somebody out or a machine gun could open up. 60 days is probably about right. It's about all you could take. It wore men down, psychologists said. That kind of life probably would do that to you. You're not surprised to hear that, I don't suspect. But these same psychologists also talk to fighter pilots. Let me tell you about fighter pilots in World War II. Their mortality rate was 50%. If you're having your briefing that morning looking at maps of where you're going to be going and you're looking around the room, half of the squad standing around you is not going to be there when you come back and land. 50% of them were killed in combat. And yet... The dogfighters loved their work. These fighter pilots claimed, 93% of them in the survey with psychologists, claimed to be happy in their work. Their mortality rate's way higher than an infantryman. And yet they're claiming to be happy in doing what they're doing. What makes the difference in their outlooks? Well, psychologists determined that it was the fact that the fighter pilot had his hand on the throttle. He was in the cockpit, and however tenuous his future might be, at really the flip of a coin is how tenuous his, his life might be, he felt like he had some control over his circumstances. An infantryman had virtually no control, it seemed like to them. They felt helpless about their external circumstances. Perceived control creates calm Lack of control gives birth to fear. As some of y'all are sitting at home this morning, you're going, okay, Blake, I really haven't been in a war. Well, neither have I. So that doesn't connect with me. Maybe you're saying, well, here's one that might. You ever been in traffic? You ever been stuck in traffic? A more recent study by German researchers has determined that if you are stuck in traffic, your chance to have a heart attack increases by 300%. You think about it. When you're in traffic, you have lost control of your life. Oh, sure, you know how to drive, but so-and-so over in the other lane, who knows what they're going to do? And that kid over there is texting. and supposed to be driving. And you have no idea why traffic is stopped over the next hill. You're just sitting there. Gridlock is the ultimate loss of control. We may... We may know how to drive ourselves, but we're not sure about anybody else. Anxiety grows as perceived control 
diminishes. And so here's our human response. We talked about this a moment ago. We try to control everything. We try to control everything. We put helmets on our kids to to keep them safe. We say, never give your heart away because it might be broken. We take clean sheets with us on vacation because who knows what happened in those sheets before. We make phone calls and text and, and we demand that our kids get put on the right sports team. We sock money away in the stock market so there'll be something there when we retire We eat only vegetables. We eat only vegetables and nuts because they're supposed to be good for you. We try to control everything. You know the problem with trying to control everything? You can't. You can't control everything. You can eat the most healthy and nutritious food in the world and still get cancer. You can have millions of dollars in investments and been as smart as anybody has ever been and lose everything in a recession. And y'all, what would life be without love? Without true love? So the honest truth is you can't control everything. And the most stressed people in the world, you know who they are? Control freaks. You know why? Because the one thing they're trying to do, they cannot do. They can't manage that thing they're pursuing more than anything else. In fact, the more they try to control the world, the more it careens away from them out of control. So the answer to panic, the answer to the anxious heart, is not to lock down my management Of everything in my world. Y'all, Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived. Now, the fact that that's going to strike some of you as kind of strange tells you how far we have moved away from true knowledge in our culture. In fact, if you did a a little trivia game with, with a bunch of friends or even your family without listening to this message and you were to say, who's the smartest person who ever lived? Jesus probably would not be named. Maybe Plato, maybe Albert Einstein, maybe Bill Gates, maybe the obligatory rocket scientist might be named. But Jesus probably wouldn't show up. But y'all, Jesus knew more about living and how to live life than anybody who's ever lived. And I know what you're thinking, Blake, you're a pastor, you're supposed to say stuff like that. You're a Christian, you're supposed to think Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived. Don't take it from me, take it from Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi didn't even, wasn't even a Christian. And he knew and he looked at the Sermon on the Mount, the passage that we're reading today, and he said that's the best advice for living ever given by anybody. Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived. And when it comes to worry and anxiety and panic, he knew what we were supposed to do. He knew how to give us good counsel. He tells us instead of worrying to do something different. He said, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. That's Matthew 6, 33. And and scholars who study this this section of of Matthew say that Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else, is the linchpin for this entire three-chapter section. Not just this small section, it's also the linchpin for this small section of Matthew's gospel. It holds everything together. So seek the kingdom of God first. Don't fret. Instead of hoarding to avoid hunger or scarcity, seek first God's kingdom. Instead of wringing our hands at at 4.30 in the afternoon over the tanking of the NASDAQ, seek God's kingdom and His priorities first and then do what you need to do. Now, I know I've just given you a couple of examples there. And some of y'all are going, oh, Blake, that is so super spiritual. Thank you. But, Blake, I'm not a super spiritual person. I just need some practical guidance for my life. You're supposed to say stuff like that. You're a pastor, after all. I get it. Seek first the kingdom. But that doesn't help me do it. This is where it gets more real, isn't it? Because if you're like me, 
And I've already shared with you my own struggle with worry as few as, a, as, as recently as a few hours ago. If you're like me, I don't like what happens when I get anxious in my body. My stomach doesn't behave itself. My sleep goes and finds another place to lay its head. My skin breaks out. And that's the best of it. My worry doesn't just affect my body. It affects my relationships. When I'm worried, I get angry really quickly. I cut people off in conversations. I won't listen to them. I yell at my iPad. I break things in my house. When I get worried, when the panic comes upon me, I am not the man I want to be. And I am not the man that God made me to be. And that Jesus is talking about In this discourse on kingdom living. Living in God's kingdom. So what can I do? What can I do? What can you do to move toward peace in the midst of the panic that we're in? Well, we look briefly at what Jesus said. I I want us to look for just a moment at one of Jesus' followers. Uh, His name was Paul. I want to look at what he said. And before I, I read to you what he said, I want to remind you where he is. He's writing to some friends who were over in a town in Macedonia called Philippi. But Paul is in prison. He's been in prison for over two years. And currently he is in prison in Rome. And Caesar is a guy named Nero. Under those kinds of conditions, Paul writes this to his Philippian friends. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying... Pray. You want to know how you and I can move toward peace in the panic? Well, seek first the kingdom. That's what Jesus says. But, 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 but Blake, that's just, that seems kind of hard for me to, to get into my brain. It seems kind of impractical. Can you, give me, can you bring it home to me a little bit closer to home? I think maybe somebody said that to Paul. Somebody said, okay, I heard Jesus say, instead of worrying, I'm supposed to seek first the kingdom. But Paul, how do I do that practically in my life? This is what Paul says. He says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Now, I don't know who said this first, but somebody made that even more memorable and even easier to understand than that. They said that what Paul was saying is turn your cares into prayers. Turn your cares into into prayers. If you and I want to move toward peace, we need to take those things that are consuming our minds and we need to turn them into prayers to God and hand them over to Him. That's how we'll find peace in the panic, at least some of the beginning stages of peace in the panic. My granddaddy, uh, we, we called him Daddy Pop. Uh, Daddy Pop had a saying and he would say it with a smile on his face. He would say, if you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, don't worry. If you do both, you're wasting your time. Now, I didn't know this until I was getting ready for this message, but he may have borrowed his saying from a saying of Martin Luther's. Martin Luther, the great reformer, put it this way. He said, pray, let God worry. Pray. My responsibility is to go to the one who can provide for me. Just like the birds and the wildflowers, the one who's going to take care of me. My responsibility is to go to him with what I think I need. Let God take care of all the other details. Hand it over to someone else. Someone who can control the chaos. Someone who can manage all of not just my life, but all of the universe. Because if what I need to manage my anxiety is a sense of control and I can't manage it, you need to know, friend, that God can. Our God can manage whatever it is you give to Him. That's what the birds and the wildflowers know. God's going to take care of them. Jesus commends the birds and the flowers to us in this passage. But in several other places in the Gospels, He commends someone else to us. He commends children 
to us. In fact, he says, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Y'all, if we're talking about living in the kingdom this morning, and we are, and Jesus says we can't enter unless we become like children, that's an important detail to know. You and I are supposed to be like children. And y'all, in, in some ways, children and birds are kind of alike. Neither one of them have the capacity or the wherewithal to take care of their needs beyond the moment they're living in. They can't do it. A child won't do it. They have to depend on somebody else to look after them. So I, I need to, I'm going to close with a story about my family growing up. We, we grew up camping as a family. And um, uh, my, my parents, and when I was in second grade, I think my older brother was in third grade. We were younger elementary school students. Uh, we would jump in the Buick LeSabre and pull a 23-foot coachman trailer. We went all over the place. And I remember my dad, we'd, we'd go camping. We'd be heading out west. And my dad would get up in the morning at the breakfast table. He'd pull out the trip ticket. And he'd figure out how far we were going to get that day. Then he'd pull out the AAA guidebook. And he would, he would call from a pay phone. That's something some of y'all don't know about. He would call from a pay phone and make reservations at that campground. And sometimes... We had car trouble. or Sometimes we had trouble getting out of the campground and he would have to call back and cancel that reservation and put one closer to where we we're going to be. Y'all, we were going in uncharted waters the whole way, but we were going, we were going to go see the country. We did it. It was just, it was a wonderful time. But I got to tell you, you get in a Buick LeSabre, you got mom and dad in the front seat, and then in the back you got three boys. It was a fight almost all the time in the back seat. Until the sun went down. And when the sun went down, one of us would get the seat, one of us would get the floor, and one of us would get the back window. Y'all, I cannot tell you how many times I went to sleep in the car, but woke up in the camper. It, it happens so many times, I cannot even tell you. I would be asleep, I'd go to sleep with that clickety-clackety, clickety-clackety, the interstate underneath the car, I would go to sleep with that. But I, when I woke up in the morning, I was in the camper. My mom would wake me up, it's time for breakfast, you need to go to the, the bathhouse and, and get cleaned up, we're going to we'll be getting on the road in just a few minutes. And I would step out, and y'all, we're not just on a, on a pull-off on the side of the road, a rest area, we're in a campground. And if you've camped, you know how much trouble it is to set a camper up. My mom and dad set the camper up at night. Getting it level, plugging the utilities in, water and, and sewer and electricity. And then they had to get us from the car into the trailer. Get the beds down, make the table, turn it down into a bed. All of that was done for me. And I didn't have to do a thing. Y'all, you want to find peace in the panic? We have to trust God like I trusted my parents and even more. Because my parents couldn't control everything. But they were going to take care of me. Friends, your God is going to take care of you even in this time, in this season. That we're in. Jesus put it like this in John 16, 33. He says, you can have peace in me. In this world, you will have trouble. But be brave. I have defeated the world. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for offering us peace. You offer us peace in your Son, Jesus, and He offers us peace as we put our attention and focus on You. God, I pray that we as Your people would have the wisdom and the courage in this time of so much tumult to put our attention and focus on You and trust you. You can handle whatever is coming in our lives. God, we thank you that you care so much about us. 
Help us, Lord, to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're tuning in and you're not a First Baptist Clinton person, you may just want to tune out right now because I I need to say something to our congregation. We have a a lot of things going on in our church and we want to kind of make some announcements and some of these are particularly local. Uh, The first thing I want to talk about though is giving. In this time where we're not gathered together and you're not having an offering plate passed in front of you or you're not in your Sunday school class and given an opportunity to give, you may forget about the importance of giving. Y'all, ministry is going on in this church even now. Things are happening and and things have to get paid for the church to continue to work. We need your gifts. And so I hope that you will make giving a part of your life. And if you don't yet participate in our text giving program, if you'll just take your your cell phone out and you'll type in on the two line 73256. 73256. And then in the message line, if you will put FBC Clinton. No spaces. FBC Clinton. If you will type that in there and hit send, you'll receive a message back, a link. If you'll click on that link, you'll be given the opportunity to put in your bank account data or your debit card number. And then you'll be given the opportunity to choose where that gift goes. The default for our church is always tithes. We want you to give to the budget of the church first. And then over and above that, we encourage you to give to the new building or to give to missions. Y'all, we're in a season right now of North American missions. We want you to give to North American missions as well. Y'all, ministry must continue. And without your gifts, it will not be enabled to do that. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's been a good worship service, and I hope that, uh, that the Lord has used what you've heard and uh, what has been sung and, and read and even prayed to, uh, to, to encourage you, to help allay some of your fears and remind us that uh, we are not alone. We are uh, the body of Christ. We are with the Lord, and, uh, and we are with one another. Uh, we are having to practice uh, physical distancing. We've got to be, uh, take seriously what the health uh, officials are telling us, but let's, let's practice that, but let's not practice social distancing, and by that what I mean is getting disconnected. Let's use the technology that's out there. Let's use the, the older technology, even the telephone, to, uh, to stay in touch with one another. That's what uh, we pastors have been doing this week, uh, calling one another. I encourage you to do the same thing. In the hour before we had our worship this morning, we, uh, I was meeting with the Joy class, which is the brand new class that, is, uh, that, that we've started. In fact, if you're not part of a Sunday school class, uh, believe it or not, I'm going to in, in, uh, to encourage you to become part of one. Uh, we've got several that are using the video teleconferencing that's out there, Facebook, Zoom, Skype, all those kind of things. Uh, the Zoe class was also meeting this morning the same time we were this evening. The uh, Thrive class is going to be meeting uh, online, and uh, other classes were still working out the kinks, and uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to give each other grace on that. We're being stretched right now. We really are, and, uh, and you know, maybe that's a bit of a good thing because that means we're going to be reminded that it's not just Sunday morning when we need to be staying in touch, not just Sunday morning when we happen to see each other in the hallways here in the sanctuary, that we should be ministering to one another. And so there's a lot of opportunities to minister um, this, uh, this week, a Monday and Wednesday and Friday, I believe, at uh, Clinton High School. They're going to be getting meals together. I was there last uh, for the past Friday, had a great time. We're practicing uh, pretty carefully, some physical distancing there. We've got gloves on and stuff like that, but there's a lot of, of opportunities. Check on the senior adults or anybody else that you know that is doing some, uh, some self-isolating offer to uh, bring things to them to their doorsteps. But let's be the presence of Christ to folks in ways that are safe but that are meaningful. Let's take, uh, let's take advantage of the, uh, of the technology. Uh, during our normal services, we pass the friendship pages, and one of the things we remind folks to do is to write down their prayer requests. So I encourage you to uh, write that, uh, to to send those by email to, to us pastors or to the church office. Uh, the uh, Zoe class has already forwarded theirs to me, and so we're going to share those. We're going to pray for those. And so let's stay connected. 
socially connected, spiritually connected as the body of Christ. Let's be examples to, uh, to one another and to the world, as Pastor Blake said, to, to cast our worry on the Lord. I was doing that as, uh, as Pastor Blake was preaching. I was thinking of the things that I've got going this week and the concerns I had, and, and I've got to do that too. I've got to be intentional about that. So let's, uh, let's do that. And I want to just close this out this morning in a, in a prayer as we head back into the week to be the presence of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the technology. Thank you for the ability to stay connected with one another. Father, help us to continue to be intentional. Help us to cast our cares onto you and just hand those to you. I hand mine to you right now, Father God. You take them. You've got great big hands, Father. I thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to enjoy the, the connections I get to make this week by phone and other means this week. So let us just, uh, just trust in you, Father. That's what it comes down to is just trust because you're a good God. You're a loving God. And as we were talking about in our joy class this morning, you're not on, up on some high place. You're down here with us. You're with us, Father. We're not alone. And we thank you that we're not alone. Thank you for Jesus Christ who is our Lord and Savior. And I pray in his blessed name, amen.